Hi, it's Steve Hargan, and welcome to our mini conference, Library 2019 Emerging Technology. This is the opening keynote. Special thanks to San Jose State uh, University School of Information, founding partner of the conference, and Dr. Sandra Hirsch is the co chair. So I'm going to turn some time over to Sandy. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like, as the director of the School of Information at San Jose State University, uh, we are very pleased to have been the founding partner of the Virtual Library 2.0 conference series. And we're really excited to uh, welcome you all today to our Library 2.019 uh, mini conference focused on emerging technology. I want to especially thank um, our partner, uh, Christina Mune, who has um, partnered with us to put today's excellent conference together. Uh, she's been a tremendous help in helping us organize and shape this conference, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it today. So with that, I'd like to pass it back to uh, Steve and Christina to, so that we can get into hearing from our, um, our great keynote panel that will be starting just very shortly. So welcome, everyone. OK, go ahead, Christina. Great, thank you, Sandy, for that introduction. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone here today and thank you for joining us um, at the Library 2.019 Emerging Technology Conference. So I'm Christina Mune, I'm the Associate Dean of Innovation and Resource Management at San Jose State University Library. I've had the awesome opportunity there to implement many emerging technologies and systems that enhance library services and spaces and programming over the last eight years. Some of my favorites that we've been working on recently are probably the Clever Lab. So it's the King Library Experiential Virtual Reality Lab and our Rapid Prototyping Lab, which is staffed by a graduate student who's also a NASA intern. We're also currently testing a chat bot built by virtual interns from the San Jose State I School, which you can hear more about during one of our presentations today. So I was very excited and honored to be asked by the I School and Dr. Hirsch to organize this conference, and I have learned so much uh, while reading the proposals and speaking with our presenters. I made you full screen, did that make you pause? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Okay, just wanted to make sure that there wasn't a sound problem. Um, so I've learned a lot and I think that I found that libraries truly are living laboratories for emerging technology, constantly improving themselves through its application and providing equalized access and support for all our communities, be, they, be them students, researchers, potential, potential entrepreneurs, citizen scientists, lifelong learners. Um, we really enable them to explore, engage, and create with the most cutting edge technologies available. And you'll see that through the presentations today. We have ones about augmented reality, virtual reality, AI, drones, robotics, makerspaces, chat box, uh, Discord and Twitch, which my gaming friends tell me I need to learn to use, um, and also about inclusive technology design and emerging technology MOOCs that help us prepare for all these technologies on that are coming up. Our speakers span all types of libraries, archives, and information organizations across the globe. And I think it's really clear from the conference schedule that information professionals everywhere are evolving their institutions, bridging that digital divide, and transforming our communities through these emerging technologies. And that includes the members of our amazing keynote panel. So each of our panelists here today are working with and researching technologies and libraries and they will share with us today the emerging technologies they believe are the largest on the horizon and how to prepare for those. So we'll also have plenty of time for Q&A after the presentation. So please put your questions in the chat box and we will hopefully get to all of them. Um, our first speaker today is going to be Bohan Kim. So Bohan, if you want to share your screen while I introduce you, that would be great. So Bohan is the Chief Technology Officer and an Associate Professor at the University of Rhode Island Libraries. She is the author of two books, Understanding Gamification and Library Mobile Experience, Practices and User Expectations, and the founding editor of ACRL's Tech Connect blog. 
She is the past president of the Library and Information Technology Association and serves on the advisory boards and committees of the ALA Office for Information Technology Policy, San Jose State University School of Information, and Library Pipeline. She holds an MA in Philosophy from Harvard University and an MSLIS from Simmons College. So thank you so much, Mohan. And it's all yours. All right, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? And it's, it's my slide showing? Everything is Okay, excellent. I had a little snuffle there <laughs> trying to make it full screen, but I think I got it all sorted out. So, uh, I'll get it going. So today I will be talking about three notable near-term technologies that I picked. Uh, so very happy to be here. Thanks uh, to Christina and uh, folks at the Library 2.0 uh, for inviting me. I have, oops, oops, sorry about that. It's not, okay, there you go. <clears throat> So the three technologies that I uh, picked uh, for today are smart voice assistant, natural language generation, and computer vision. And these are all powered by artificial intelligence, which most of you would have no doubt heard quite a bit these days. I have about like five to seven minutes for my part today, so I cannot go very deep uh, into any of these technologies. I also won't have time to talk about artificial intelligence in general, but there are lots of resources about it. <clears throat> but I will try to provide uh, a brief explanation about each of these three things that I have picked. So the first one is smart voice assistant. Uh, they have been gaining traction in the consumer market in recent years. They are already familiar to many of us through sort of smart speakers such as Amazon Echo, Google Home, Max and Mini, and Apple HomePod, uh, as you see here. Smart voice assistants such as Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, Apple Siri, Microsoft Cortana, and Samsung Bixby power these uh, smart speakers. These voice assistants are also included on our smartphones, tablets, and often computers themselves and they let us use these devices with our own voice command. So it's sort of a natural user interface. Currently, voice assistants are used for relatively simple tasks, such as looking up something on the internet or getting information about the weather or current news, and also, of course, shopping. But these um, intelligent, smart voice assistants are getting smarter. So last year, Google unveiled the new AI-powered feature of Google Assistant called Duplex. And some of you may have watched the video of this demonstration. If you haven't, I highly recommend doing so because it's really incredible. So this uh, Google Assistant feature called Duplex um, can make a phone call uh, on its own to a restaurant and make a reservation for you or uh, schedule an appointment on your behalf with another person at the, uh, at the other line. Um, and it is very, very natural. Google also announced that the real-time translation feature originally developed for Google Pixel Budge will be made available for all Google Assistant compatible headsets very soon. Note that smart voice assistants may also uh, get added to other home appliances in the near future. Recently, Amazon added Alexa to a microwave, which also works as a convection oven and an air fryer. And I'm not sure how smart move that is, but uh, there is no denying that these things are going to be included in every electronics uh, very soon. At the end of 2018, about 41% of US consumers owned a smart speaker. Uh, that is almost twice as many as uh, in 2017. And this shows the public's increasing adoption of the smart voice assistant. And libraries are trying to keep up with this trend by developing custom apps for those voice assistants, such as Alexa Skill or Google Assistant Action. And with those, custom library apps, library patrons then will be able to get their questions answered automatically in a similar way that they would use their smart voice assistant. This article that you see in the American Libraries Magazine reports that libraries are using these voice assistant functions for event calendars, catalog searches, 
uh, item holds and advocacy and so on. But these um, smart speakers are always on and listening. There is also growing concern about consumers' privacy. While companies such as Apple, Amazon, and Google deny any eavesdropping, eavesdropping by these uh, smart speakers, they, there are many users online reporting otherwise. So that's one uh, near-term technology that I believe is going to have a lot of impact uh, on the way we live and work, et cetera. The second pick is natural language generation. So natural language generation is a technology that turns data, structured data, into a natural language, such as English, French, German, et cetera, and generate sentences and paragraphs for people to read and understand. And just like the smart voice assistant, natural language generation is also powered by artificial intelligence, uh, you know, and machine learning, which is a subfield of artificial intelligence. So the Washington Post, USA Today, Reuters, and BuzzFeed, uh, all these media companies are experimenting news writing with uh, AI technology. Heliograph, the Washington Post natural language generation application, produced the news stories about the Olympics and elections. Uh, and this was done based upon the given narrative templates and a set of structured data provided. With it, used by USA Today, creates short news videos that condense news articles. And Bloomberg News produces as much as a third of the content that it publishes relying on this AI tool called the Cyborg. This tool Cyborg helps reporters produce thousands of articles on the quarterly earnings reports of businesses. These natural language generation applications were also used to create many news articles on baseball, football, and earthquakes at the Associated Press, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times, respectively. Natural language generation dramatically lowers the cost of content creation. So media companies can generate a much larger number of stories quickly to cater to many small audiences on local or niche topics. And the third pick uh, is computer vision. So computer vision is a subfield of artificial intelligence that trains computers to interpret and understand the visual world as we see it as humans. And actually Google Lens is a good example of how this computer vision is applied. So here are some screenshots of Google Lens in action. Google Lens is a set of vision-based computing capabilities that allow a smartphone, uh, Android phone, uh, to be precise, to understand what is going on in a photo, video, or live camera feed. And it is capable of performing real-time translation and object identification from the camera screen, which is really, really cool. So it can scan and translate text that you see through the uh, camera of your uh, Android phone. It also allows one to look up words and events to one's calendar, add events to one's calendar. Also call a number if the number is like in the phone number format, or just copy and paste to, you know, the text the words in the text. So on the left, you can see that Google Lens is actually um, identifying uh, the restaurant menu, uh, and it's also bringing up the reviews online uh, for each dish, so how good it is or not, you know? So that's a pretty cool. Uh, you can also point the camera of a Google Lens compatible smartphone to a popular landmark and find the historical facts so you see in the middle, <clears throat> this historic building, and then the camera recognizes this and then bring up information about it. So associated historical fact, if it is open to the public, the hours, the even entrance fees. And then on the right, you can see the Google Lens identifying Tulip, right? You know, so all of these uh, things can make our lives much easier and more convenient thanks to computer vision. 
Uh, but it also raises many concerns about people's privacy and the technology's overreach because we rely a lot on vision. So when computer is able to perform similar tasks, there is increased uh, amount of risk associated with that. Uh, and as you can see from these new stories, existing biases in all AI algorithms are also something that we must be aware of and find a robust remedy before they get uh, more widely uh, adopted. So I believe that these three AI technologies that I talked about, smart voice assistant, natural language generation, and computer vision, these three, I believe, will have a significant impact on our daily lives in the near term. And I think those would be something that we should uh, keep our eyes on. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Boyhan. I think those are really uh, interesting developments. I definitely think a theme at this conference and in tech development is AI personalization and like the impact that that data and the collection of that's going to have on us. So thank you so much. Um, if you have questions uh, for Boyhan, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box and then we'll be asking those at the end. So we'll be collecting that. Um, our next speaker is Ida Arlene Joyner. She is the senior librarian. She is a senior librarian at the K-12 Universal Academy in Texas. She is the author of the book Emerging Library Technologies. It's not just for geeks, which is like an amazing title. I love it. And an upcoming book on drones and libraries that will be available in July 2020. She was a visiting scholar at the Life Under Drone Symposium in Tacoma, Washington in September. She's also a member of MIT's Technology Review Global Panel, as well as LIDA's Information Technology and Libraries Board, where she performs peer review for LIDA publications. She publishes frequently in emerging technologies and has presented internationally on a variety of topics. Ida holds her MLIS from the University of Pittsburgh and is currently a doctoral candidate in Texas Wesleyan University's Curriculum and Instruction Program. Thank you so much, Ida, and you can take it away. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, hello everyone. And I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about um, uh, three technologies, virtual augmented reality, uh, 3D printing, and uh, also uh, robotics. Um, but first, I like to start with a little tech humor. Why did the developer go broke? Because he used up all his cash. How many programmers does it take to change a light bulb? None, it's a hardware problem. Are you a, a geek or a gadget king or queen? Does technology, does it make your heart go pitter patter? Uger, uh, Uger. <laughs> Uber, Google, Tesla, Audi, and some of the other major car manufacturers uh, are, of course, working on self-driving cars. We have our smart watches, smart clothes, other tech wearables um, for 3D printing. We have the prosthetic limbs for humans and animals. Um, we have, you can make jewelry, have food, um, et cetera, uh, with 3D printing. Uh, robots uh, helping patients out of their beds, greeting patrons at our local libraries, drones carrying pizza, emergency medical supplies like in uh, Rwanda, uh, delivering um, other types of items as we know uh, with uh, Amazon. And in the future, um, we'll be using drones to deliver books. So let's have a little bit of fun here. Um, again, uh, um, feel free to, uh, to comment in the, um, the uh, comments, the chat box. Um, if you're a geek, gadget king or queen. Uh, emerging technologies, we can think of emerging technologies as, as uh, technologies that, um, that are new, um, but it can also include some older technologies that, that might be considered controversial. Um, and for those who, who are inventing some of these technologies, um, there are large economic rewards. I'm going to start with our first one, virtual reality, augmented reality, which is a very exciting technology. It's been around for a very long time. And so when you think of virtual reality, you can think of computer technologies that replicate real or imagined, um, that they simulate a user's physical presence, um, that they artificially create sensory experiences that we're familiar with, our sight, touch, 
um, hearing, smell. And in the past, they've mostly been used in the military and entertainment industries, but now we know that, um, that they're used in every industry um, imaginable. Um, it's really taken off in uh, libraries and um, healthcare. Um, and some of the, um, some of the actual uh, devices, um, the Oculus VR, uh, Google Cardboard, um, there are just a myriad of um, devices that are available. Um, and so how can VR be used in libraries? Well, it uh, levels the playing field. Um, the prices have gone down considerably, so there are many libraries that are utilizing um, virtual reality. Um, and some of the libraries actually check out the equipment. Uh, patrons can check them out for, um, for two weeks, one week, uh, it varies. And uh, patrons from all backgrounds and economic levels can come to public libraries, for example, and utilize the equipment. And so uh, it levels the playing field. And uh, it's very good for uh, STEM, for engaging students, to want to pursue um, the science, technology, engineering, and math fields. And uh, it's, uh, it's a, a really uh, uh, great resource that is, uh, is, it's actually, it's growing by leaps and bounds. Some of you have probably already implemented um, it in your library. Google Cardboard is very inexpensive. Um, and so um, probably many of your libraries are already uh, utilizing it as well as others. Augmented reality, uh, you can think of that as um, that it's a um, real world environment uh, where the elements are augmented or supplemented by um, computer generated sensory input. Um, and you can think of it in terms of sound, video, graphics. Um, and so what it does is it merges 3D virtual objects into uh, a 3D real environment um, and displays it in real time. And so you can take your, your smartphone and, um, and actually we're going to look at uh, Google Expedition for just a couple of seconds um, in the next coming slide. But some of you probably have already used Google Expeditions, which is really, really, um, it's really wonderful. Um, you um, have your smartphone and, um, and it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's, just, it's just really wonderful. Um, and so um, Google Expedition, it's an app that you download uh, to your smartphone, um, to your iPhone, your Android, whatever device you have. And so um, Google has some really wonderful information out on their website as well as uh, video clips. So I'm gonna try, hopefully, um, Hopefully you can see this on my screen. And so if you go to this site, you'll see that um, you can scroll down and there's an actual video here and you can see that there's the cardboard um, reader right beside it. And, uh, and you can actually play the video. And if you look over to the left, there are over 900 VR expeditions that are available to you uh, to explore. And so um, if some of you are using this, in your libraries now, um, feel free to 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 uh, type a little bit in the chat room about how you're utilizing virtual reality um, through the uh, Google Expeditions. And then if you scroll down uh, a, a bit more, there's the augmented reality uh, that brings the world into your classroom. And there are 100 AR expeditions that are available uh, for you to see. And so you can have an optional selfie stick too. Um, I'm not gonna play these videos, but I highly encourage you to, um, when you have a minute, if you haven't already, take a look at these videos that, uh, that Google has, uh, has put together. So um, you can go to the, um, to the website to see that. Um, and so again, if you're using it in your, in your workplace, um, in your library, feel free to enter some of that into the chat room. And so I'm going to take about two minutes uh, to, um, to go through uh, robotics. There are a lot of libraries all over the world that are implementing um, robots or have implemented them. And some of you might have them in your library. Some of you might have them as part of uh, STEM uh, kits 
where uh, patrons can come into your library and you might have a um, have a container where you might have a small, say, Finch robot or a Sphero uh, robot, and maybe some books um, that are introduction to um, to, to uh, robotics for um, for young children. And you might have that all together in a kit that patrons can check out. Um, and for those of you who like trivia, the word um, robot is derived from the Czech word robota, which means uh, labor uh, uh, or, um, uh, or uh, a work. And so um, in your libraries, you might have your robot where it can interact with small children through your story time programs where the robot can sing and read and dance and otherwise engage in children. And they found that robots um, are great for children with disabilities because children feel much more comfortable. They might not feel comfortable talking to another human being, um, but they feel very comfortable uh, talking with their with their robot. Um, and what the research has shown is that some of these children who are very, um, who don't feel comfortable talking will, um, will actually sometimes get with other children and start talking about the robot, um, which is something that they, um, that they, and they feel very confident and comfortable doing that. So that's really good. And uh, li librarians can host robotics classes and competitions in, um, in their libraries. And we have libraries all over the world who are doing that now, where students, they learn how to use, design, and program the, ro uh, the robots that we know can lead to highly financially uh, lucrative um, careers in the STEM area. Um, and so here's an example here with uh, Westport Library. I'm not going to play it, but they actually have a uh, talking robot in, uh, in their library in Westport, Connecticut. Um, so if any of you are using robots in your library or thinking about uh, integrating them into your library, uh, feel free to, to enter that information into the chat room. And uh, our last one is 3D printing. I mean, it's 3D printing is being used uh, just in every way imaginable, from making uh, pancakes to building homes, cars. Um, it's just it's an amazing technology that's going to continue to uh, to grow by leaps and bounds. And um, many libraries now, of course, have the 3D printers that um, that they've obtained through grants or um, donations. Uh, and so it's a wonderful technology. And you'll see there's, a, there's an image of, um, of a 3D printer in the screen here. And so you can actually download some of the uh, models for free or at low cost from different websites. I'm gonna go over to the screen now where you can, um, where you can see some of the places you're probably familiar with these such as the NIH they have their 3d printing exchange program um, there's the top 10 best websites to download 3d models here you have your I materializing uh, I materialize thing um, thingiverse 3d model databases so there's some really great opportunities for um, for 3d printing um, what does the future hold for these technologies? The possibilities are endless. Many libraries are implementing them already. As the prices continue to drop for these and other technologies, our libraries are going to uh, obtain them through grants, gifts, purchases. Um, I recommend seeking opportunities to collaborate with others so that you could get um, some of the uh, technologies that might be a little bit more expensive than you have um, the funds to, uh, to purchase. And so keep reading, keep learning, keep tweeting, and um, keep having fun. And so um, I'm just going to have a screen on here, too, of keep, uh, how you would keep abreast of these emerging technologies. Breathe. Um, you saw some of the wonderful resources that Boyan um, had obtained um, articles from. These are some of the publications here, MIT Technology Review, The Economist, Guardian. Um, there's so many on here that to choose from. But first, you want to pause and breathe, and you want to skim, and then, um, and then uh, and then decide if you want to read the whole article. If you want to implement these technologies or others in your library, you want to get your stakeholder buy-in, you want to engage your legal department, know your audience, um, know your costs so you can 
find the money, you want to build strategic partnerships, you want to look at who's going to be your tech expert, how are you going to market it, what is the safety and security. So these are some of the things you want to keep in mind when you're thinking of implementing any of these emerging technologies into your library. Um, and so um, here's a, a screen of, uh, of my book uh, and you'll see some of the uh, technologies that, um, that I have uh, included in my book. So um, thank you so very much. And feel free to, um, to answer any questions in the chat room. So thank you. Wow, thank you, Ida. That was great. I, that, I, your questions created a lot of conversation in the chat box. So hopefully people are checking in with that. People are posting lots of links and information. So that's great. Um, I also really like the idea of using robots to engage children with disabilities and get them communicating. I didn't know that they responded so well to robots. So that's, um, yes. that's amazing. Thank you. Um, all right, our next presenter is Jim Hahn. Jim is an associate professor and the undergraduate library at the University of Illinois. Jim's research into technology enhanced learning has led to many software development projects within library settings, including the creation of the Minerva Project, which is an open source library services app that promotes the use of the Internet of Things, also known as IoT, and user data and wayfinding and recommendations. He is currently serving as the primary investigator for the University of Illinois grant-funded project Information and Environment, Integration of an IoT-Powered Recommender System within the Folio open source platform. And just for everyone to know, Folio is an open source integrated library system, which is actually really exciting. The results of this research will also be made available open source on GitHub, which is amazing for libraries. So thank you, Jim, and take it away. Okay, um, let me see, just getting my screen to share. Um, one second. Well, I don't know if you have the um, slides that I previously sent, if that's possible to pop them up or. Uh, yeah, let me pull that up. Okay, sorry. Jim, are you having trouble bringing them up on your own computer or sharing them? Um, I have them on my computer. The security settings on my laptop are, uh, not letting me share them with uh, uh, yeah okay I have them up Let's see. Share. oh you have embedded fonts so I, okay so no promises on formatting but okay no problem um, um, okay so, um, yeah, sorry about that. I uh, have a new uh, operating system. The uh, oh, no. most recent version of uh, Mac OS has a really great security. Um, so um, this is what I intended to share. It's, um, I'm gonna be talking about knowledge panels, um, AI machine learning for data discovery and reuse, which is partially based on a workshop I attended at Carnegie Mellon um, in May. Uh, last summer. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, really uh, what, I, what I intend to kind of communicate today is uh, two features uh, that I see um, that I see libraries really leveraging uh, for sort of increased sort of discoverability and adding new value to um, collections that m may get overlooked. And I think part of the knowledge panel development is almost like um, a type of search engine um, optimization in the sense that we want to get, um, you know, our library data into those knowledge panels that, that are surfaced on Google and we want to um, make our collections more interactive. So um, I'll talk about that and then machine learning uh, methods. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is, this came out of some research by a uh, uh, Dr. Fenlon and, and others, and this is about sort of linked data and really seeing the deep um, sort of connections that are in um, special special collections. These actually came from this, this um, graph and node um, network graph 
is about family connections derived from notes of uh, Philip Kolb um, and the life of Proust. And um, what's really excellent is this is just sort of a new way to engage with uh, collections that previously kind of didn't exist. And um, it definitely offers sort of more analytic insights by using linked data. So that's definitely making possible unique scholarship and, and you know, increasing discovery and access to unique resources. Uh, mm. Next slide, yeah. And then um, they also, Dr. Fenlon's group also looked at sort of um, asking users um, how they would use knowledge cards. And what was interesting is they thought that um, that you could, um, these knowledge cards were, were useful in disambiguation of terms. So uh, this kind of gets at uh, sort of a subject browse, but a more, I would say, um, actually it's sort of like the next generation of subject browse where it can, it can really help you explore um, your content. And this item is enhanced with contextual um, information derived from external sources. And those might be like Wikidata. That seems to, to me, that seems to be like one of the large um, linked open data sources that libraries leverage. But there's, there's a number of others depending on sort of which cultural her heritage institution um, you're working with. Um, then um, this is kind of, yeah, this is kind of just a more blown up image. And I think we're, kind of familiar with these in Google in the sense that um, we've seen these knowledge cards. Um, they, I, you know, I find them pretty helpful for getting quick information. And I think that libraries are really poised to um, not only develop their own knowledge panels on their like search result page, but really start to integrate using linked open data and um, some other formats that I'll talk about on the last side, slide about sort of getting our unique content into uh, search engines. Um, next one. Uh, so a project that we did here at Illinois is um, account-based recommender and sort of it take a, takes a look at um, subject subjects that you have. Um, so you've checked out some books, those have uh, subjects associated with them. And we did this recommender system pilot where we used um, frequently occurring subjects that like occur together in a checkout. And we use that to um, make a sort of um, authority-based browse, a sort of a Netflix, Amazon type browse. And what's, what's very exciting is that if you dig into the linked data for production, um, second phase project, um, in their background project and goals, um, this linked data for production is, you know, sort of a library, library focused, and there's several academic libraries that are working on this, and they reference being able to do sort of a Netflix and Amazon type browse. And I think um, these models are great because I think they introduce another paradigm into um, they introduce another paradigm into the search, which is not just based on sort of known title searching, but uh, sort of exploring. Um, and and I would say like you know Netflix and Amazon has sort of pushed our um, pushed the expectations of users to be able to do um, something like this. So these are recommended based on sort of items you might have checked out and they're um, sort of helping users sort of see what else is available that they may have missed in just their um, you know, item search of the catalog. Um, and then um, there was a, a talk by uh, OCLC Research when at Carnegie Mellon in May and they were using uh, machine learning AI methods in um, subject prediction and their study looked at automatic subject assignments and their findings were that this this could really help help users but also their proposed algorithm isn't isn't necessarily like a hundred percent complete so there's there's some initial work here from OCLC research and I think they wanted to be um, they wanted to do a machine learning slash AI project that um, really um, spoke to sort of the needs of their users and and what what may help libraries. And I think automatic subject assignment is a great place um, using, you know, basically a classification problem with deep learning. Um, and I'll have links on, on my presentation so you can take a look at the research. Um, yeah, and then um, this is kind of my third, the, the third theme is really some technical principles. And I think that um, we, as libraries need to start with some smaller pilots before we do large scale implementations. 
And I think machine learning tools are, you know, have to be used, you know, where appropriate um, in recommender systems or projects with already labeled data. If you have some labeled data, um, that's a, you know, that's already the first start because machine learning projects really depend on, on their data, data sources. And then finally, um, I, I recommend sort of taking a look at linked data in both schema.org and other linked data standards that can capture sort of the expressiveness of MARC. Um, a project that I worked on used both schema.org and Bibframe and sort of kind of depends on sort of which interfaces you're gonna use. Uh, schema.org descriptors work great for elements of the web and I think Bibframe more geared towards library systems. Um, and so those are some under, underlying technical principles for sort of operationalizing some of these knowledge panels and machine learning type projects. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Jim. I am kind of a discovery nerd myself, so I love this stuff. I think it's very difficult sometimes to explain um, bib frame and linked data and how that all works to people. So I'm wondering maybe on these references or if you have this kind of our first question and I get to ask it because I'm the moderator. Um, do you think there is a, a resource that helps people understand um, linked data and, and it's used in machine learning like that for like beginners, do you have something that you would recommend? Yeah, um, one thing that's sort of a free, a, a free tool. Uh, there's a Coursera course called AI for Everyone. Um, it's about a one month uh, course. I think it can take um, eight to twelve hours potentially. I think that's a good introduction to um, sort of like what you know what is the language of ai and just getting um, a foundation in ai um, in terms of like linked data um, i would say the linked data for production uh, wiki page is a pretty good um, starting point uh, library of congress uh, bib frame website is excellent and um, actually taking a look at wiki data is, is another very good place so there's yeah there's several sort of um, introductory places um, to, to get started on the web. Great, thank you. Um, let me take a quick look at the um, question and answers, um, just so we can go to some audience questions first. So Peggy asks, um, with Google Lens on an iPhone, can you search and identify photos taken previously in Google Photos or just live photos, just live images? Uh, as far as I can tell, you can use Google Lens directly with your phone when your camera is on. So there is no option as far as I can tell because I don't have an Android phone. So this has to be like, you know, qualified by the statement that I only tested on my own iPhone. <laughs> there's no option. So if you have Android phone, maybe you guys have extra features, it's totally possible. But at least on iPhone, you need to download the Google app first in order to use it. And then once you open the Google app, you can select the Google Lens icon in the search window and that will activate your camera and then there will be a bunch of options at, uh, at the bottom. But as far as I can tell, there's no way for you to bring that up to use that feature to photos that has been already taken. So hopefully that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Um, we, um, another uh, participant asked for ex specific examples of usage of robots in libraries. I will say that we have a presentation, um, I think starts at one about ro robots in libraries. And so you should definitely attend that and they have a number of examples. I don't know if we can go over them uh, right here. I wanted to ask um, a question of the whole panel, is that given the wide variety of technologies that are emerging at kind of an ever quickening pace and the seemingly always limited budget situation, right? right. How do you suggest um, that library professionals choose what the library or archive or institution should focus on offering? Like how do they select the thing that's maybe most impactful for their organization and that they should invest their time in? And maybe you could tell us how you chose like the emerging technologies that you focus on as an example of that. And we can start um, any, anywhere, whoever wants to start. 
Um, I would say, this is Ida, uh, I would say that uh, basically you want to know uh, your audience. Um, who's your audience? Um, and who can you uh, who can you build a strategic partnership with? You, there might be a company that's near your library that uh, you might be able to work with where they could maybe donate some of the equipment. Um, a good way to find out what people want is, of course, to ask them. Um, you know, you could have focus groups. Uh, I know that um, one library in particular here in Texas, uh, their director said, okay, um, I know drones are very popular, uh, get them in here. Um, and so, um, and so actually, uh, gave him the money and uh and he went on amazon and um and and bought uh several of the uh of the drones um it, it's a it's a matter of what type of library you are and and what kinds of um what kinds of projects you you you're, you're interested in. um i know there are some libraries that were given grants through um, the National Network of Library of Medicine, for example, uh, to purchase 3D printers. Um, they wrote a proposal and, um, and were funded. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of, of uh, keeping abreast of technology, seeing what your audience, your patrons want, and then um, determining if it's something that you can afford. Um, if if not, um, I actually have a chapter in my book on how to get stakeholder buy-in for um, implementing emerging technologies in your library. And so uh, basically you know, what I talk about is um, find out who your big, uh, your board members or your um, whoever's in charge, basically the big kahuna, um, and, um, and, and research what it is that you wanna have in your library um, based on need, right? Based on audience. And then do your research, um, get with your legal department, um, find out how much it's gonna cost. Again, find out if there's if there's some organizations um, that you can partner with. Um, if you're a university, um, certainly there are departments that you can partner with. Um, if you find out that they're working on a particular project that you might be interested in, meet with them and, um, and talk about how you might be able to um, have the technology housed in your library. Everybody comes to the library. Um, and, and again, build these partnerships um, and, and put together, do your research, put together your proposal and, and submit it to your, um, to your director of your library, your board members. It all depends on, on who the, basically who the, 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 the big kahunas are. Um, and that's a good way to, um, to get them into, uh, into your library. So, um, that's what that's what I've done. Um, in I've worked in academic, public, and uh, school libraries. And there was a technology that I read about, or that I attended a conference and learned about it, um, and then research, researched it, found out how much it costs, what it would take to get it in to the um, to the library, um, and put together a proposal and submitted it to the CTO or the director or um, you know whoever was in charge. And when you're putting that proposal together, make sure that you include in there um, how it's going to benefit your um, your organization, how it's going to benefit your key stakeholders. Um, you want to make sure that you um, that you speak to um, why it's absolutely important, must have that you get that technology um, into your library, and also talk to other organiz other libraries um, that have implemented the technology that you're interested in. Um, and learn their best practices and lessons learned, put that all together in the proposal and then submit it. Thank you. Rayhan, Jim, do you have any thoughts about that? 
Uh, yeah, this is when I will just add a, a quick couple of things. So yeah, the relevance is really important. So every library serves the different communities. Uh, so if you're a librarian, library professional, you are the ones who know the best what the needs, the pressing needs of your community is. So I would always recommend selecting a technology that would have maximum impact with the limited resource that you have, right? So like uh, always the most shiny technology would not going to be the best to pick for your particular library patron community. So that should be the uh, important uh, criteria when you make your choice. And then, uh, but with the caveat that never say just to no know because you don't have enough money because we always, uh, you know, have a shortage of funding, right? But uh, always find an innovative angle so that even if you know that this is going to serve the need of your existing community of library users, find the particular innovative angle that you can kind of infuse into uh, your library program or service or whatever um, initiative that you want to uh, create so that it would inspire and uh, excite people. And when you have a good idea, uh, you will find the new revenues for funding. So uh, do not just give up saying that, well, I want to do these great things, but it requires like $20,000. We don't have $20,000, therefore we cannot do it. So don't have that kind of uh, sort of defeatist uh, mindset. It's not very helpful. So I would like to emphasize uh, picking something that would really serve the, the real need of your community uh, and at the same time, try to do something innovative uh, that would excite your uh, user community at the same time. Thank you. Um, maybe we have a few more minutes. I wanted to change gears a little bit and ask a question about actually um, data and data privacy. You all touched on AI and like personalization somewhat in, in library services. So, you know, as libraries are making choices between personal privacy, identity security, and the organization's desire to tailor the experience to the user and like utilize AI and engage in data driven decision making, where do you think libraries should fall on that spectrum? spectrum? Like, how do you advocate for that, um, that balance or, or where, where do you want your library to fall on that? Is the question too big? Sorry. <laughs> I can, uh, I can uh, start uh, start us off. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah, and I thought, I mean, I thought a lot about privacy with regard to the recommender system that we worked on here, and it is an opt-in service. And I will say that um, we developed a privacy policy for this service, um, and it basically it um, includes like all the information that. A user might want to know about how their data are stored, um, what data are used, uh, what you can do if you have questions about the data, who you can contact. So um, I think it provides a way um, to have a conversation. Um, but of course, um, this kind of gets to like, how do you know what to implement in your library is um, working with like your senior admin staff sort of, and this is something that we did here is we had a lot of conversations about like what's like, what is it that uh, our population wants? And we were seeing that our graduate students, um, they did see the value in recommender systems for um, gaining other, other perspectives from disciplines outside their own. Um, certainly the university is founded on disciplinary knowledge. However, like interdisciplinary um, viewpoints are, are, are very valuable as, uh, as well. Um, so um, with regard to privacy, I, I think like an opt-in policy is important. I think understanding your population is, is critical. Um, and then just aligning it with, you know, what is the user story that you're trying to meet? What's the problem that you're trying to solve? So I think like a pragmatic approach saying this solves XYZ problem with um, information search. And um, in terms of like data retention, I would say libraries need to retain um, um, only, only the data that, that are necessary to retain and really uh, protect, uh, when looking at vendor agreements, really protect um, any data that 
a third party vendor might have access to and, and try to um, either strike those out or make sure that things aren't being collected that don't necessarily need to be collected. Great, thank you. I think that's a really excellent answer. I do um, like the idea of limiting the retention and the opt-in policy I think is really important. Um, I did wanna give everyone a few minutes at the end of this hour to get to our next session. So I'm gonna go ahead and close our uh, keynote panel. Thank you so much to all our panelists today. And Jim, there was a, a request if you could add maybe to your slides a link to the privacy policy that you were talking about. I think people wanted to see a um, example of that. I also want to thank so much the SJSU iSchool, Dr. Hirsch, and Steve Hargdon for helping us so much with all the technology and organization of this. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of our presentations today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the panel. Thank you. Okay. Steve, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but I wonder if it's just me. <laughs> You're kind of yeah, breaking up. Okay. I'm having a hard time hearing Steve too. It's maybe one out of every five words or something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Steve. We can't hear you. <laughs> oh, okay, Steve we dropped off. So, yes, please um, check your uh, schedule that you received when you registered for the conference. It has. Um, you want to go to your time zone and click there, and you will have all the links to the rest of the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, panelists. You're great. You're great.